Good afternoon and welcome to this Amber and BGA webinar. My name is Leah and I'm Head of Events at Amber and BGA. Today it is my pleasure to be joined by Angela Lane and Sergei Gabatov for their webinar on how transparent conversations in the workplace lead to increased productivity, engagement and results. Angela and Sergey work and write about the complex science of human performance while making it simple. Leveraging Fortune 500 experience gained across four continents, they equip leaders with practical tools for success. In today's webinar, they will give you the skills to be more open and transparent and thus increase your team's productivity in the workplace. Without further ado, over to you, Angela. Thank you so very much, Leah, and uh, everyone, thank you so much for joining. It is our absolute pleasure to be here. And today we are talking about feedback, and it is, I'm sure you know, it is a hot topic at the moment. There's discussion, there's debate about how feedback should be given, how much we should get, uh, even whether or not it's good for us to get feedback at all. So let's ground ourselves in what we know. What we know for sure is that formally or informally, we're being assessed all the time. Your boss, your peers, your team members can't help but form a point of view and opinion on how you're doing. So we're, we're being assessed. Second thing we know is that the research but I think so again, I would say our experience as well, tells us that people actually feel chronically dis deprived of feedback that could help them. So we're being assessed anyway, we're deprived of feedback. What we want to do is to talk about what would happen if you could actually get that feedback and how could you use that to really kind of operationalize uh, a process where you digest the feedback, you accept it, internalize it, but then ultimately know how to act on it in ways that would result in sustainable improvement and ultimately, of course, better performance for you. Uh, my name is Angela, you heard that. I'm here with my colleague today, Sergey, and we are practitioners in, the, uh, in this area. We're researchers, we're analysts, and in Sergey's case, he's an academic in this field of human performance. I hope that you can tell uh, by the end of this webinar that we're absolutely passionate about helping individuals reach their full potential. And that passion has led us to study and write on the role of feedback in productivity improvement. And ultimately, we co-authored uh, a book, Fair Talk, to try and codify everything that we know about how feedback actually helps you lift your performance. Increasingly though, we find ourselves asked to take on a role where we talk about not just feedback, but for those that are lucky enough to get it, how they can use it in really, really effective ways to kind of jumpstart uh, their, their productivity uh, and importantly then the things that flow from that career, et cetera. So today we're gonna to cover three things we are going to make the case for why feedback matters. And uh, you know, we'll focus ultimately on what to do when you get the feedback, but we find that it's increasingly uh, true that we have to make the case for why feedback matters and then make it again and then make it again. Uh, and uh, there's some good science as to why that is, and we'll talk about that a little later. So we're gonna make the case for feedback. Secondly, if you do accept that feedback is important, we'll look at how we're doing collectively. Uh, and a bit of a spoiler alert here, actually, we're not doing uh, so well. There are a lot of powerful psychological forces at work that make uh, it really hard for us to hear and successfully act on feedback. So Sergey's gonna talk to us about some of the psychology behind why uh, we're not doing as well as we might with acting on feedback. And finally, we're gonna dedicate the lion's share of the time to looking at what successful people can do with feedback to make that important difference to their performance. And uh, for those of you that are paying attention, you've probably already cottoned on to the fact that there's actually a bit of an opportunity here. Because if feedback does matter to performance, and if we know that most people aren't uh, acting on feedback or aren't hearing it and acting on it, for the person that does, 
almost by definition, you've got a source of competitive advantage right there. Uh, so hopefully that has motivated you to, to, to listen because there's a bit of a source of uh, competitive advantage here for uh, somebody who uh, wants to take some of these tools and apply them in their workplace. So on that note, let's, uh, let's get started. And I said that I would get started with this uh, idea of looking at why feedback matters and making the case for the importance of feedback. So your performance, leadership, and career depend on feedback. That's a big, uh, that's a big statement. Uh, but we've got kind of three reasons why we, uh, why we know that to be true. The first is that we, all of us, can go through uh, through life, through work, um, without knowing that there is indeed any need to change in the absence of, of feedback. Performance improvement is unlikely to happen if we simply don't know what it is that we need to change. Secondly, even uh, perhaps if, uh, if we have some awareness, it's likely to be pretty low and pretty inaccurate. If your performance depends on self-awareness, knowing your strengths and knowing your weaknesses and how they impact your behavior is pretty important. Um, what we know about, uh, about human psychology is that people tend to overestimate their strengths. We actually think we're kind of quite good at stuff. Um, but we also tend to blank out or ignore critical feedback. The implications of, of that is that it often has a, very, uh, a, a negative impact on our career and certainly at cost to our employers. Unfortunately, the higher up the ladder we go, the harder it is for us to actually you know, get feedback that might uh, cause us to more accurately assess our own strengths and weaknesses. So there's this kind of issue of self-delusion and the higher up the ladder we get, the higher up the corporate uh, ladder we go, uh, the more self-deluded we may be, not, uh, not intentionally, but um, because we're not hearing or not understanding um, our strengths and weaknesses. And you can imagine the implication of those first two points on our, uh, on our career. If we're unaware, of where of what needs to be worked on. If we overestimate the extent to which we're good at something or the extent to which we're bad at something, it really has a potential to impact career. And when you think about your career journey, we liken it to a GPS system. You know, you are navigating your career and you're getting data points. The GPS is drawing on uh, satellites to send data points to let us know how we're going, what we have to adjust and where we have to turn in the absence of that GPS system working uh, so that we can know when we're on course, off course, the chances are we're not going to land at our preferred destination. And fair feedback will really help you reach that desired destination in your career. So um, I am going to turn over to my colleague, Sergey. And Sergey, knowing that feedback is important to how we focus our efforts, how we prevent this risk of self-delusion, uh, how we know where we're going with our career and how we can get there faster. Um, what do we, uh, you know, what do we think, how do you think we're doing uh, in terms of feedback? Do we get it, not get it? How are we doing? Oh. Not so well, not so well, Angela. Um, and uh, that, that's, uh, I, I guess, the reason why we, we are having such a great turnout for this webinar today. People are really eager to know, okay, um, now that we've established uh, that feedback is a great thing uh, for your success, and not that we've established it just in this webinar, we've known it all, all along, um, everyone is keen to, to, to hear how we are doing and what we can do in that regard. So uh, how we're doing, and Angela has already alluded that not that well, why? There are three general issues that make it hard to uh, digest and act upon feedback. Uh, first, we don't hear it. Uh, second, we don't care enough to do anything with it. And three, we don't want to change. We like our habits and routines too much. So let's explore each of these three points in more detail. First, we don't hear it. Why? The culprit behind not hearing the feedback is our brain, and this is how it happens. So first, 
each of us has a view of who we are and how good we are at doing various things. Such a pity that most of uh, the time it's not true. Uh, research tells us that only 15% of populations are truly self-aware. And what about the remaining 85? It may be simply that they're victims to the confirmation bias more often. Uh, what, what is confirmation bias exactly? Two things. First, we selectively process information to accept only those bits that confirm what we think of ourselves. And by doing so, we unfortunately may contribute more to the self-delusion. And secondly, when most people are confronted with the fact that they have made the wrong decision, they are unwilling to admit it. And uh, th th this is uh, the statement of a famous psychologist, Tomas Chamorro Primuzic, uh, vice president of uh, uh, talent science at Manpower. Uh, he says that in order to save face and avoid feeling stupid, uh, people engage in a range of unconscious tactics that help them distort reality in their favor. Think about this powerful statement. We discard any ego damaging information. So often constructive feedback falls on deaf ears. Uh, second, the attribution error. And uh, this is a classical uh, psychological bias. We ascribe successes and good results to ourselves while uh, failures and setbacks to others or just bad luck. And this greatly limits our ability for introspection and decreases the desire for feedback. And finally, nature abhors vacuum. In that respect, each one of us is somewhat of a Hollywood playwright and director. So if we don't hear feedback soon enough, after something has happened, we will create our ver own version of the event, our own movie, pretty much embellished and the one that absolves us from any wrongdoing. And we will start believing in it. So when we hear the negative feedback that is inconsistent with that movie, we'll reject it and the loop closes. Okay, this may be a generalization, but these are the fundamental biopsychological principles of how we're wired as humans. And unless we make a conscious effort, these biases control how we see the world. And most of the time, they do. Let me share a few examples. So first, we're delusional about our performance. And there is this famous 2007 Business Week studies when people were asked whether they are top 10 performance in their company. When they asked middle managers, 84% of the middle managers said that they were in the top 10 of performance in their company. Now, uh, things got really bleak uh, when uh, the reporters asked the executives. 97% of uh, executives said that they were in top 10 of performance in their company. Now, we are uh, lay HR folk, and we don't do much about mathematics, but we are pretty sure that this is statistically impossible. And uh, this just uh, confirms to us that we tend to overestimate our abilities and uh, you, you, you have heard those stories about uh, more than 90% of people believing that, that they are above average drivers. And funny enough, when the psychologists replicated that experiment in the trauma wards of hospitals, where people get after being in a car accident, and they ask them the same question, uh, do you think that you're above average driver? Uh, again, 85% of uh, people who've just been in an accident said yes. So this is a very pervasive uh, problem. But you might think, OK, uh, feedback is somewhat uh, nebulous, ephemeral. It's about the soft things. Surely when people see the hard data, they're able to make, uh, uh, make sense of that. Well, not necessarily. In an interesting uh, field experiment in a retail a store chain, uh, the, uh, in, in, in three months uh, study of sales associates, Researchers correlated actual sales data, actual performance ratings, and employee self-assessment. So the researchers wanted to see if this information um, uh, would influence the supervisor's behaviors and their performance evaluation. It did not. However, something else emerged as an outcome of the study. Not surprisingly, the employees' performance ratings were significantly correlated with their sales. So in statistics, when you see the, uh, uh, the, the, the stars next to the numbers, it means a statistically significant correlation. So actually, the, the ratings of supervisors 
were significantly related to the objective performance in dollars. However, the self rating were not related either to the supervisor ratings nor to the objective hard data on how those self associates perform themselves. So seeing uh, the actual data and, and, and information uh, may not necessarily result in greater self-awareness for all the brain reasons and, and, and our own human psychology that uh, we have just, uh, uh, just discussed. And if we don't hear, if we don't understand that, how can we self-correct? And I would like to uh, quote Tomas Chamorro Primuzic again. He said, nothing resists change more than positive self-delusions. If you believe you're great, why would you want to change? So this takes us to the next reason uh, of why, uh, how we uh, deal and how we relate to feedback. We don't care enough. Uh, even if we hear the feedback, we may decide not to act upon it. And there are two key reasons uh, that we would like to highlight why that happens. The first is we are short-termist. We downplay the long-term negative consequences of not changing. So imagine that you are a successful account manager. You've just graduated from your MBA and you've landed a top job at a nice firm. And uh, it's your first 360 degree feedback report. And you read there that you might you, you may come across as aggressive to others, but you beat the plan each month, you get a big bonus, and your boss is very happy with your results. So you decide to do nothing with this feedback. But weaknesses left unattended are time bombs for your career. Strengths overdone can result in de derailment too. Insensitivity to others, and this is what might be behind this feedback. So insensitivity to others is a major career stopper. By not addressing this issue early, you're compromising your future success. The second issue is that in some organizations, people may get away with bad behaviors and poor performance for too long. Rob Kaiser spoke about the managerial accountability crisis at the 2015 Society of Industrial and Organizational Psychologists Conference. His research shows that two out of three managers are shirking the responsibility for holding their employees accountable. And in the absence of accountability, only the most willful and driven will succeed in personal change. Again, this is a time bomb. The fact that right now nobody is demanding the change from you doesn't mean that next month you will get a new boss or move to a new company. So why wait? Finally, personal change is hard. We are creatures of habit. Habits don't just uh take time to form they take a long time to break and replace as we uh, get more experience our desire to minimize behavioral choices and decision making drives us to become a product of our own default setting the automatic instinctual autopilot way of living life to make matters worse success reinforces our habits the more experienced and more successful we are the harder it is for us to change Charles Duhigg explained how habits work, and you see the loop on the screen. There are three basic components, the cue, the routine, and the reward. Imagine that you are in the habit of rabbit responding to emails. It may have a very well-intended motivation. You want to be productive. A possible habit loop could be you complete a task and have an urge to do something. So that's the cue for you. Your routine is to flip to inbox, and there you find some more emails. You respond to them rapidly and get a dose of dopamine, a hormone that gets produced when you accomplish something. That's your reward. Dopamine makes you feel great, but it's also produced when you smoke a cigarette or gamble. Dopamine is associated with addiction. Now, you may be addicted to your inbox, which actually detracts from productivity because now you, can make, you can't make time for strategic thinking and stepping back. Our bad habits stand in the way of greater personal effectiveness, but they can be changed. And a little later, we'll show you how you can use the same habit loop to build new productive habits to act upon the feedback that you receive. So now that we have covered what typically happens with feedback, we don't hear it, we don't care enough to act on it. And if we do, the change is really hard. Um, Angela, um, what can be done about it? 
Oh, great, uh, great question. Uh, so hopefully everyone is tracking with us. There is this case for feedback, which we believe is compelling. And yet we've heard from Sergey how woefully inadequate we are as humans internalizing feedback and then applying that. Uh, whether that's because we prefer to defer, uh, that's that short-term versus long-term orientation. Maybe it's because change is hard because we have to address entrenched habits. But for whatever reason, uh, you know, despite feedback, change is, is hard and just ask anyone who's ever set a New Year's resolution. Uh, so what do you have to do to become the person that is the exception to the rule that says people don't change? So let's uh, let's make ourselves the exception to that uh, to that rule. So the first clue to what uh, we can do goes to a topic that Sergey touched on earlier. He talked about the fact that our core wiring is programmed in such a way as to help us keep our ego intact. And we do that as humans by ignoring data that might damage our self-perception. So the first trick um, is that if you can be the sort of person who can reframe feedback, um, you'll hear it in a different way. You'll hear it in a way that lets you keep your ego intact. So consciously reframe feedback. So what does that mean? What if instead of hearing a critique, you viewed feedback, for example, as being a key to success? or somebody sharing with you a secret formula. Uh, you may have heard the expression, feedback is a gift. Some people have this knack for reframing feedback in this positive way. And you can see on the screen some great uh, quotes there, but they go to this idea of, if you assumed the intention was positive, that someone was giving you a good thing, you'd hear it very differently. And there are so many examples of people who excel in life who have innately this attitude to feedback as a positive thing. So I might think of uh, entrepreneurs, for example, Bill Gates. Great quote from Bill Gates. Uh, he has said, we all need people who give us feedback. That's how you improve. Um, Winston Churchill, I know that this is uh, being, uh, this uh, webinar is, is from London. So Winston Churchill, he talked about criticism may not be agreeable, but it is necessary. It fulfills the same function as pain in the human body. It calls attention to an unhealthy state of things. Obviously very eloquent, uh, Winston Churchill. But leadership experts like Ken Blanchard was quoted as saying, feedback is the breakfast of champions. And one of the uh, writers in this area that Sergey and I uh, follow, Nobel Prize winning scientist, Daniel Kahneman, he says, true, um, true intuitive expertise is learned from prolonged experience with good feedback on your mistakes. So pretty compelling evidence that people who can accept and assume this positive intent, all of a sudden, see feedback, feel, experience feedback differently because we're no longer triggering that ego protective mechanism. Those leaders that I quoted have this in common. They assume positive intent. So without feedback, so we assuming positive intent, uh, intent, how do we get comfortable then with the feedback that we're hearing, both positive and negative? So we talked earlier about the fact that without feedback, you actually have no awareness of the need to change. And particularly, it's the negative feedback that often makes people uncomfortable if there's a gap has been highlighted uh, between who they are and the person that they want to be. Um, so without highlighting that gap, we're not going to get, uh, get change, but people have this view that it's only good news that um, can make uh, can make the difference. You might have also heard that, uh, and certainly there is a movement around. Well, couldn't I just focus on my strengths? You know, if if I like to hear good news, that makes me feel good. It doesn't damage my ego, and 
if there's evidence that working on my strengths is really going to uh, to make a difference, why couldn't I uh, just do that? There is some research actually on uh, positive psychology that says that um, you know there is um, benefit from focusing on your uh, on your strengths, and you know we don't want to take away from that. There is, however, also a wealth of evidence that you need to focus on your weaknesses and address areas of uh, improvement. Um, if you only work on the positive, you actually have the risk um, that you will uh, that you will derail. And finally, um, getting only positive feedback makes us immune to negative comments. Um, we sort of lose our ability to take those negative comments and we build up resistance uh, to those negative uh, to those negative comments in uh, in the long term. So tip number one was that we need to assume positive intent. Tip number two is let's start to get comfortable with the idea that positive feedback is good, but also a good dose of negative feedback not only is most beneficial to my career, not only does it help me address what needs to improve, it stops me building up this resistance to negative feedback in the long term that could be even more damaging. So I'm going to assume positive intent, but I'm going to get comfortable comfortable with the negative and with the uh, with the positive. And here it might be a uh, a good uh, time to talk about some of the data that confirms this idea that you know the negative and the positive uh, are both important to us in terms of our growth, improving our performance, etc. There was a very detailed um, meta study that showed that frequent feedback um, makes people seek out more feedback. And what the study showed that was really, um, really interesting was it didn't matter if that feedback was negative. It didn't matter if the frequent feedback you received was negative. The more feedback you got, the more feedback that you, uh, that you sought. And the negative feedback had a stronger effect on people's feedback seeking behaviors. Poorer performers were incentivized for ask, to ask for advice on how they could improve. And so the frequency meant that despite that potential to hurt our egos or to damage our self-interest, uh, self-image, we were still, uh, still had enough self-interest uh, to try and get more, uh, more feedback. So there's a bit of a tip there if you're trying to build a feedback-rich culture, Give it, give it often, and uh, and people will start to uh, start to demand it. Uh, another study uh, that's very interesting: uh, data entry work. So, you know, a, a very measurable, um, concrete sort of work. Feedback is given to uh, to folks. For those people who received positive feedback, uh, there was a 21% improvement in their performance. So, people that were given negative feedback, there was a 21% increase in, in performance as well. So don't be frightened to give negative feedback, but the message for you, I think, also is don't be frightened to hear negative feedback. Um, so yeah, I think uh, that's another great tip, be open to the positive and the negative. But moving on, what's the third thing that you might do that would help you be the sort of person, remember what we're talking about, the sort of person who loves feedback for breakfast, um, you could validate it. This is really super interesting. So you're assuming positive intent, so you've got the right mindset. You know that feedback can be positive or negative. It's going to increase uh, your performance either way. Um, so you're really ready uh, and wanting to take it on board. How do you help internalize it? Because our natural response to feedback is an emotional one, we can get a lot of benefit um, if we try and apply our analytical brain to the feedback. It'll help take some of the emotion and the risk of a kind of an immediate emotional reaction out of the equation. So you can build a practice when you get feedback, even when you're assuming that positive intent, you know it might be negative. If you 
build the practice of standing back and reviewing the feedback that you're being given and objectively trying to validate it, your relationship with that feedback is going to change. You're going to take out some of the emotional elements by engaging your analytical brain, you're actually going to bring objectivity and eventually what's going to happen is you're going to decide that, you know, what well, this feedback has uh, validity because you've validated. So what would uh, you do to kind of quote unquote validate it or analyze the feedback? Well, you could ask things like, would working on this topic help me? Or you could ask things like, is the person giving this feedback credible to me? You could ask things like, hmm, is this feedback balanced? Is it fair? Have I heard this sort of feedback before? Is it something I can influence and, uh, and work on? Um, not all feedback is created equal, that is for sure. But by going to a mental process of examining the feedback, validating it, you're actually going through a process that's helping you internalize it. You apply an analytical approach and that's going to temper the brain's uh, desire to automatically jump to an emotional response. So engage your kind of analytical brain in there and uh, you'll really start to internalize the feedback as though it's, uh, as though it's your own. So you've assumed positive intent, you've understood that you need to work on the strengths as well as uh, those weaknesses, you've validated the feedback to build its credibility in your own mind, what could you do next? Well, we also heard Sergey talk about how change is really hard because of that cycle of habit building. And because we've built habits, anything that changes that really requires that we have a lot of willpower and a lot of dedication. And our own brain is going to try and sabotage our change efforts along the way and take us back to that nice, comfortable zone of our old habits. So we need something that actually anchors us and acts as our North Star that can keep us engaged and motivated when the going gets a little tough. What are the sorts of things that we can do uh, in order to kind of engage, find that anchor and engage that North Star? And our values um, anchor us to what's important to us. So people do things, in other words, for their reasons, not ours. We do stuff because of what matters to us. For some people, that might be saving the planet. For others, it might be getting uh, a pay rise. Our motivators are really personal. But there are three types of broad motivation, motivators, and you can try and figure out which is yours and really tap into that, know what drives you. Some of us are, if I look at these three broad categories, achievement oriented. It's all about getting ahead. Some of us are relationship oriented. It's all about getting along. And some of us are looking for a sense of, of purpose, a sense of, of meaning, making sense of, of the world. Um, that may be a source of motivation. Spending time understanding what drives you will actually make acting on feedback easier. So for example, if you really want to get ahead, what is it that I need to do that would make such a difference? And why is it worthwhile? How does working on this piece of feedback help me get ahead? Or how does working on this thing and improving my performance help me make sense and find meaning in my, uh, my work. When you trigger your own motivators, you provide a lot of energy uh, around that change that otherwise could be, uh, could be tough. Uh, if you do that, then acting on your feedback gets easier. Feedback, after all, is, is really just information about what you should do more of or less of. By understanding that and understanding how you can modify your behavior spurred by what matters to you, the higher salary, et cetera, you're really starting to resolve to make change. You'll see how that feedback helps you get what you want by doing more, by doing less, or by making a change. And then finally, that North Star, formulating that desired state 
in a motivational way that can really keep you engaged. This is having a clear vision about where you're going. This is you being great at this new behavior. It's you imagining what you're doing and how great that is going to feel. It's you reflecting on what others would say when they observed you behaving in that new successful way. We encourage people to write it down. We encourage them to write a powerful statement about their future you and to create that vision of what it's going to be like and how good it is going to be when you actually get this thing nailed. Very, very exciting. Um, so if you are clear in your North Star, you can now start to turn the same human psychology that can be a negative for us into a positive. Remember we talked about changing habits, we said it's hard. If that's true, then by definition, if you build a new habit, it's going to be hard to change. So the question becomes, how do I build a new habit? And the answer is, yeah, hack your brain. So what do I mean by that? Remember Sergey talked about uh, triggers, things that um, uh, cause us to act on something. Maybe it's the, the ding of your computer to say an email's arrived. And that when you act on that, you carry out that routine, you get a great feeling, you get a sense of satisfaction, a sense of reward. You can try and recreate that same habit building process intentionally instead of um, uh, unintentionally. So how would you do that? You'd try and identify a trigger, something that will help remind you to act in a certain positive way which is the new skill, the new uh, behavior that you want to, uh, to build. The trigger could be a time. You know, I'm always going to meditate at 6 a.m. in the morning. It could be a place. Whenever I'm, um, you know, at this place, I'm always going to do X. It could be an event. Uh, it could be a person. Whenever I'm dealing with Sergey, I will. Uh, you find a trigger. It could be a sticker on your computer. You name it. But when you encounter that trigger, you're going to practice your positive skill. Um, we like to encourage people to think in terms of what we call micro skills. What do I mean by that? You know, instead of trying to address a big kind of nebulous concept, you know, I want to be more inspirational. That's pretty big and pretty nebulous. Um, we encourage people to try and get concrete to try and find a behavior that's practicable, uh, find the small things that you could actually do and learn, that if you built up a lot of those small things, would eventually look like, in this example, inspirational uh, leadership. Um, but find that micro skill that you're gonna practice. When you encounter your trigger, you're gonna practice that micro skill, and then you're gonna look out, you're gonna actively look for evidence of reward. Um, you could look for examples of whether that behavior helped move you towards your North Star. Uh, maybe you can feel great about your progress. Maybe you're getting some positive feedback from others. Maybe you're seeing your results start to improve. We encourage people to actually look for progress to actually trigger the reward center in their brain. Uh, when you do that, what's going to happen? That nice positive cycle when you next encounter the trigger, you'll have a lot, of, uh, a lot of motivation to retry that same action. That will lead, hopefully, to that great sense of reward, and you'll set up this virtuous circle. The more repetitions of the circle, the easier the behavior becomes to practice. And of course, the easier it is to practice, the more we'll practice it. The more we practice it, the better we get. So virtuous circle to build new habits and then we'll be able to leverage that um, that fact that habits are hard to change. I mean this time the hard to change habits will be the habits that we've built with intention based on having great feedback. So Sarah, okay, how in real practical terms would we recommend that people kind of get started uh, that's a, a fantastic overview of what could be done, Angela. Thank you so much. 
Um, and uh, it's always such a great pleasure to be talking to audiences of MBAs, whether we do webinars like that or when we teach MBA classes, because we know that uh, you are ambitious, uh, you want to succeed, you want to do uh, well, and you want to be good. And uh, there is a lot of passion uh, behind uh, uh, e each of the future leaders that, uh, that you are. And uh, we know the psychology of leaders, they get motivated by a challenge. So we've created a personal challenge for you. Um, you will get to choose what will you do next time that you receive feedback. Or maybe there is a piece of feedback that you've been mulling on for the last couple of weeks and you aren't sure how to proceed. So um, think about that. And well, we want you to be very specific about it. Saying, fine, I'll do it is not enough. Because good intentions have a bad reputation. Oscar Wilde, uh, in the picture of Dorian Gray said, good resolutions are useless attempts to interfere with scientific laws. Their origin is pure vanity. Their result is absolutely nil. I, I, I love Oscar Wilde just for putting things uh, bluntly out there and he was absolutely right. Uh, holding a simple goal intention, like I intend to lose weight, doesn't guarantee goal achievement because you may fail to deal effectively with own habits, uh, willpower, and non-conducive context. So those uh, old feedback loops and the environment that you're in will actively be pulling you back into the old behaviors. So simple goal intentions don't work. The correlation between those intentions uh, and behavior are very modest. And uh, very often just saying, you know, I, I'll do that, I'll lose weight, I'll be uh, more collaborative, I'll uh, be a better team member, I'll be a better partner, don't work because they're not specific enough. A much more effective way to make a personal change is to form, and here comes the fancy psych term, uh, to form an implementation intention. An implementation uh, intention spells out the when, where, and how of the new desired behavior in advance. So if situation Y encountered, then I will initiate goal director behavior X. So I can think uh, next time uh, Angela and I are giving a webinar, I will use shorter sentences um, uh, in, in order to be more impactful for the audience. Uh, the two magic words are if and then. Uh, for any obstacle, just thinking if X happens, I'll handle it while doing Y makes a huge difference. Uh, here's another example. When I see a muffin, I'll have a piece of fruit instead. How powerful are these two simple words? They even work for people who have serious behavioral problems, drug addicts going through withdrawal, with no if-then implementation intention. Zero people followed through on putting a resume together. But when the two magic words were used ahead of time, 80% of people, eight zero, were ready to apply for a job. What's so powerful here? You are getting your non-conscious mind involved. Instead of waiting until problems arise, you're giving your brain a habitual response to enact on autopilot. So take a couple of seconds, write down using this formula, uh, how are you going to deal with feedback that you have received recently or will receive in the future? So write it down. Next time I hear information about my behavior that I disagree with, then I will write it down or I ask a friend about it or I will um, uh, talk to my boss or something else, or if um, my project uh, goes off track, uh, then I will, each one of you has a unique situation, each one of you has uh, unique ways of dealing with work-related or even uh, in any life situation. Uh, feedback will make you more successful both in work and life. So um, decide for yourself, um, which formula you want to create. And um, Angela and I will be fine with uh, whatever, as long as you leave this webinar with a personal challenge, with one 
implementation invention related to getting, processing, digesting, and acting upon feedback. So in summary, uh, we, uh, I would like to summarize here so that we have some time for questions that I know uh, you've been submitting using the chat feature. Uh, what we've talked about today, and we've summarized that uh, following this uh, symptom diagnosis solutions formula, uh, there were three symptoms um, uh, of sort of what's not going well with um, our relationship with feedback. And we said that there were uh, three major groups of symptoms. I don't know, I don't care, and I can't change. Uh, why, uh, what was the diagnosis uh, behind I don't know? It's the low self-awareness or the, the, the bias protection. Uh, we, we want to protect uh, our egos and our image from any damaging information. I don't care enough. There is insufficient motivation. You know, our habits are too, uh, uh, we're too comfortable in our um, uh, habitual ways of doing things or uh, your work situation is not forcing you to consider that your unproductive behaviors need to change. And finally, uh, we don't change because our habits take over and uh, force us into the old habit loops. Uh, the couple of solutions that we've uh, offered to you, um, get comfortable with feedback. Both positive and negative feedback is useful. It is information that can uh, help you be even more productive and more successful in, uh, in your career, both short term and long term. When you get the feedback, you need to validate that. You need to ask yourself uh, some questions, whether you've heard that feedback before, uh, uh, whether it's coming from a credible source, um, how you could um, interiorize that. All of that helps you to engage your analytical mind. It helps you normalize feedback, uh, make it back what it really is, information. And uh, once you start dealing with it as uh, with information, you remove the uh, bad emotions uh, from it. To find some motivation, identify the, uh, the, the North Star, uh, why it matters for you personally, how it can help you be a better teammate, a better partner, a better boss, a better leader, a better uh, community member. And uh, once you have uh, identified that, break down uh, that, that feedback into little things into, uh, into the micro skills that you can practice to, um, uh, to, to act upon that feedback. And uh, by focusing on those micro skills, uh, particularly using the implementation intentions, you can um, replace the bad habits with good ones and, uh, and ensure they're sustainable. With that, uh, I would like uh, to um, open, uh, open this webinar for questions. Uh, uh, Leah, um, what questions uh, do we have from uh, from the participants? Hello, Leah. Yeah, I'm you here. Must, you, Are you we ready for the question? question? <laughs> yes. Lovely. Okay, so our first question is. How should leaders or managers prepare grounds for effective feedback conversations? That's uh, that's a fantastic question. I, I uh, and uh, Angela, would you like to take this one? Uh, be, because I I know that uh, you you work on the establishing a specifically a process for that. Fantastic. So as I understand the question, we're talking about as a leader giving feedback and preparing um, the um, uh, preparing the environment for that, I would say a couple of things. The first thing I would say is, um, you know, the Nike kind of logo, just do it. Um, the biggest uh, challenge we see as practitioners is that in trying to prepare the ground and trying to do it well and trying to set high standards for themselves as leaders, uh, what often happens is it becomes way too difficult and people actually defer or put off giving the feedback and so big big challenge uh, is just getting it done so we would argue that doing it even if it's not perfect it just needs to be done so don't put yourself uh, don't hold yourself to too high a standard 
That said, uh, we believe that there actually is a pretty straightforward approach to crafting feedback in ways that are actually will resonate because they are actually deeply steeped in the science of our of our psychology. So very very simple um, three step process to, to to giving feedback. You know, craft your preparation around three ideas. One is why is this important? Let's establish first of all that you know uh, I'm telling you this because it matters. That will help someone, a receiver, assume that positive intent that we talked about earlier. Second step, you have to actually let people know how they're going. You know, our expectations being met is is the standard acceptable um, is more needed. If we're not really clear, people can go away thinking they've had a general conversation, not a call to action. And that leads us to the third step is be crystal clear about what it is that someone needs to learn to do differently. Um, and that will help them achieve the level of performance that's required. And that last piece is so important. You know, we're not encouraging people uh, to, to criticize or be negative, we're encouraging people to, as managers, to learn new things. And actually, that's highly motivational. So what is, why is it important? How are they doing? And what do they need to do now? Three really uh, practical steps that can, uh, if you, you know, take that approach, prepare for a really great conversation. Thank you very much, Angela. I'll move on to the next question. So what happens in a culture that does not support negative feedback? That's a great uh, question. And um, I would like to uh, pose a different question to, to, to address that. Uh, what uh, type of feedback is most welcome in cultures that praise high performance. And uh, if high performance is what you are after, you would be seeking information that uh, increases uh, those performance levels and help people to be more productive and be more effective. If you frame it that way, then the question uh, whether feedback is positive or negative uh, becomes moot. What becomes important is does this feedback help me to be more, uh, more, more, more productive? As Angela has shared with us, in a series of experiments, it's been proven that both positive and negative feedback uh, can equally lead to, uh, to improvement in performance. However, over-reliance on positive feedback can make people immune to constructive feedback in, in long term. So when actually the penny needs to drop, uh, people might not hear it when uh, when it becomes really necessary. So uh, if uh, there are cultures uh, that um, discourage honest feedback, uh, we always encourage leaders to be a little bit rebellious, uh, to, to, to be rebels, to go uh, to be a, a bit mavericks, uh, go counterculture, uh, because nobody uh, prohibits you personally from giving people fair feedback. And when is feedback fair? Uh, when it helps others be more effective and be more successful in lo long, long term, not sugarcoating, not withholding, uh, not uh, hoarding information that you know about the other person that can really help them. And that uh, creates even a better culture, this uh, culture of feedback where this performance information uh, becomes the, 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 lang the language uh, that uh, people communicate in, uh, in, in an environment uh, where um, uh, people are not holding back and willingly share, thrive on uh, uh, feedback uh, from each other. Perfect, thank you very much, Sergey. We've got quite a lot of questions, so I'll move on quickly to the next one. What do you suspect as detractors for effective feedback? Angela, um, uh, do you want to talk about our three Bs? Um, I, I've got a lot of things in, uh, in my, 
<laughs> going through my head about uh, the things that uh, uh, detract from effective feedback. And, you know, I, I, I think I would perhaps, you know, I don't know, talk, talk about, I'm trying to think of how to summarize some of this stuff. What do you think? Um, uh, sure. Um, so if I understood the question we're talking about, when is, um, when is it, when is feedback not effective? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so the first time, um, or first time, one of the examples of when it would not be effective is when you give people feedback on something that they can't change. Um, so you might um, do a kind of quality control check on any feedback you give and ask, is this doable? Uh, you know, if, it, if, if I'm asked to do something like, you know, just get smarter, it's like being asked to be taller, uh, it's really bamboozling. I can't do, uh, can't do anything with uh, that, one, uh, that one at all. Uh, sometimes uh, another thing that stops feedback being effective is when it's not genuine. We call it um, bogus feedback. You know, maybe I, I'm given feedback and someone has a political agenda or they have, um, you know, uh, reasons for giving the feedback that may not only be about helping to improve my uh, my uh, my performance, that kind of bogus sort of uh, feedback. So there are examples like that of where feedback just is not uh, is not going to help me be more effective because it doesn't come from the right place and it's not stuff I can do things about. Or okay. I get too much of it and I'm baffled. <laughs> that would be another <laughs> example. Or too much, you know, when I get too much feedback and I need to do 20 things and I have to do them all tomorrow and it's just baffling and confusing and uh, disheartening. <laughs> And, and, and since we're talking about Winston Churchill, you know, uh, once the, he, he gave some uh, feedback that was totally brutal um, and, and not helpful. Um, uh, there is an anecdote that uh, he was going down the stairs uh, uh, be, being drunk and uh, he stumbled into, into a woman who told him, uh, sir, uh, you are uh, you're drunk and um, uh, moreover, you are disgustingly drunk. So he looked at her and, um, and said, well, yes, uh, I'm I'm drunk, uh, and uh, you are ugly. But tomorrow I'll be so sober, and you'll still be disgustingly ugly. So um, that was <laughs> arguably. Uh, we don't know if that actually happened or not, but it's an anecdote, and that's an example of brutal feedback. When uh, you uh, th there are things that might be true, but uh, sharing them with others does not uh, uh, help anyone. Okay, um, the next question, uh, we do have a lot of questions, so I'll, I'll try and speed through them. What is, in your opinion, the difference between the suggested implementation intention and A, using smart objectives, plus B, identifying clues that trigger bad habits and to plan how you'll respond slash act to prevent the bad habits being triggered? Oh, that's a fantastic question. It, it Great actually, question. It, yes, it nicely links uh, um, uh, many of the concepts that uh, that that we've shared. So, uh, an, an implementation intention can can be acute. So, basically, an implementation intention is uh, thinking, okay, in which situation uh, when a, a situation happens, when X happens, I will do Y, and uh, defining that X in your mind is actually uh, creating that cue. It's thinking about a place or an event or a person or I, I don't know, a, a smell. You know, when, when, when I smell roses, I'll give feedback, whatever. Uh, so th that uh, <laughs> implementation is formulating uh, the cue. And uh, we remember that identifying the cue and then uh, the routine and the reward can help you form the new, uh, the new feedback. Now, the question was, uh, how is it an implementation intention different from a smart goal? A, a goal is something bigger and more uh, future focused. So when uh, Angela was talking about the North Star, that could be a goal and you can uh, define it in the smart terms. And for those of uh, our listeners who are not familiar with this acronym, uh, it's the uh, goals that are specific, measurable, achievable, 
uh, relevant and time bound. Uh, so formulating goals uh, using using that that acronym uh, can uh, help you uh, you know really define that north star so that it's something that's uh, really tangible and making it tangible uh, creates this powerful uh, motivational drive to achieve. And I think the thing I would also build on that, Sergey, is, you know, there is no um, no shortage of ways that we can try and improve. And if smart goals works for somebody, if triggers to kind of um, stop us having a bad habit, you know, to stop us acting out on a bad habit, maybe it's personal reflection and journaling, you know whatever if you've got strategies that work for you as you're trying to change or build new habits um i would i would absolutely go for them we find that the implementation intention is one that works pretty well for people because it's it's pretty specific if x then y but i would be using anything in your armory that you find has worked for you to really help you get momentum and the momentum you get the more you can activate that cycle uh, the more dopamine you'll get from the great results, uh, the easier it becomes. So we'd say yes and Okay, perfect. So the next question is, I'll just keep rolling the questions for the next kind of sure. five minutes. And obviously if people are busy and they need to get log off, then they can feel free. So as a manager, whose feedback should you take more importantly? your junior colleagues or senior colleagues, because usually they get conflicting feedback. Yeah, I'm not entirely sh Oh, sorry. I was just wondering if it was clear from the question, feedback on yourself? Um, you she hasn't um, the person hasn't specified, but I presume they're talking about they're getting conflicting feedback from their senior colleagues and their more junior colleagues. So who is, from how I've interpreted it, who's is more useful, the more senior colleague or the more junior colleague? Okay, so there's a, a lot of evidence that has come from researchers being able to look at 360 feedback and then, you know, because of its prevalence uh, and because there are thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of data points, um, there are some patterns that seem to be pretty, uh, to be pretty uh, clear, which is that um, your, your direct reports, for example, um, tend to um, see you uh, in ways that are more positive. They will tend to rate you in ways that are more positive uh, than your uh, peer group. Um, your peer group will be tougher uh, than your more senior uh, leaders uh, will be. So people's perspective does make a difference. I think what we would say is a couple of things. One is any of those perspectives may have more uh, accuracy than self-assessment. Uh, we know that self-assessment, for all the reasons we talked about earlier, is not something we want to rely on too much. Uh, we would suggest that your leader is in a pretty strong position to give feedback, so long as they've got a bit of a structured approach to thinking through and gathering uh, data points. And one of the reasons they have such a good perspective is they actually see things that for example, junior colleagues may not be able to see. Uh, they may be able to see the external environment. They may have more comparison data points. They may have five people at your level that they can compare and contrast in order to come up with a more objective kind of point of view. And often they're just more experienced in some of the technical uh, aspects of your role uh, and understand what, uh, what leads to, to success. So I would be getting my feedback points uh, from above uh, would be my opinion, unless you're getting, uh, you're wanting feedback specifically on how you do managing people. Uh, and then you might want to take uh, also some of the points of view of, of your direct reports into account. Um, but I would be pretty much looking upward. Uh, and after all, you know, companies pay for performance. They ask leaders to be accountable to assess your performance. Uh, so, um, even if it is uh, sometimes harder to take, I'd be looking there. I don't know, Sergey, what do you think? I, I absolutely agree. Uh, it it it's uh, it depends on the situation. Different strokes for different uh, different folks, and uh, depending on the competency, you would want to consult different rater groups. 
uh, for example, if the, you are interested in your people management skills, like task delegation or giving feedback, then asking your direct reports, your junior colleagues, uh, will add a lot of value because they're direct recipients of that. If uh, you're interested in your strategic skills, actually asking your direct reports uh, is uh, m maybe of limited value uh, uh, purely because of their position. That's where you would go to your, uh, to your senior colleagues. And if you want to understand how good you are at influencing and negotiation, then asking your uh, stakeholders and peers uh, might be a better strategy. Okay, great. And are you guys still happy for me to keep going with the question? Sure. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, and absolutely. Then, yeah, okay. And then how do we handle situations when the person giving feedback becomes irrational? Sometimes even losing their temper when persisted with difficult questions, especially performance related. Well, that's uh, that's an interesting one. Um, I guess uh, that's how you would deal with any uh, emotional situation. So feedback is uh, information, and information needs to be uh, processed analytically in order to be internalized. When somebody uh, gets too emotional, uh, the uh, you, you know the, the limbic part of the brain takes over and those emotional emotions will cloud judgment so actually uh, pressing with information and trying to appeal to the analytical side of the person who is visibly distressed uh, em emotional is throwing up a tantrum uh, and uh, it may be of limited value so uh, Trying to calm the person down uh, would, would help. And if you see that that doesn't happen, postponing the feedback conversation might be a, a better a better thing to do rather than trying you know, to get uh, all the message out and uh, uh, pr pr trying to establish that you're right. Um, because uh, as, as a leader, your job is to increase the force. Uh, when you give feedback to someone and they become argumentative, uh, they are thinking about, uh, and probably they are argument, uh, uh, argumentative because their ego or image is threatened. So they're thinking about themselves, not of, of their performance. Uh, you uh, should either try to get the uh, conversation back to the level of analytics, to the level of behaviors, frame that in a way that um, uh, the person understands that it's what they do, not who they are, uh, uh, th that would be helpful. So uh, always give feedback uh, that would uh, target their, their, their behaviors and the impact that those behaviors have so that people don't go into this rabbit hole of, oh no, it's about me, it's, it's who I am. Uh, that's when, when uh, the emotions get triggered. If you're able to, um, get the conversation back into that productive uh, tone of uh, focusing on behaviors versus the person, fine, continue with uh, with the feedback. If you see that the person is too distressed and uh, we've seen uh, the stories, we've heard the anecdotes of people starting to cry, um, then uh, you know, in many situations, it's best to let the person calm down and then retake the conversation uh, later. Okay, perfect. Um, we have quite a long question, so I'll go quite slowly. What do you think when your manager surprised you by recruiting an employee who will be your subordinate and you don't you don't know anything about them? And the manager just told you that we hired this person, he will report to you. Furthermore, this new employee has more experience than the person who's wrote the question. This has given him a negative impression and that management planning maybe planning to replace him with the new person that's just been recruited. As a leader, how can they deal with such a situation? Hopefully you understood that question. 
I understood the question, I think, and I think it's a really, really difficult situation. And um, I guess implied in it because of the topic of, of this webinar is um, a couple of things. One is, do you want to give feedback to your leader about how you're experiencing this? That would be a, a potential, uh, uh, you know, topic. Uh, another might be, um, should I solicit feedback to find out what skills I may be missing? Uh, that would make it necessary for my leader to bring someone into the team uh, that has this additional experience. So I could I could kind of formulate um, a feedback related aspect uh, in one of uh, one of two ways. Um, I'm favoring the second. So I'm wondering whether or not there is a conversation here with your manager about. We've got this new team member that uh, that's great. He has some really, really good skills and experience. Could we have a talk about my skills and experience and where you think um, I can uh, can improve? You know, I am interested in my uh, role. I'm excited by this company. I want to make sure that I'm meeting your needs. You could trigger that request for feedback. Um, that might be something that you uh, that you could do. But incredibly difficult situation and I suspect may have as its root cause your manager's inability to give you feedback about some things that may have been missing, some skills or experiences that may have been missing. And instead of giving you feedback, he's tried to create that plug. So bad manager, um, but maybe you can turn it into a good situation by uh, using it as an occasion to say, wow, I'd like, you know, we've all got different skills. He's got some I don't have, I've got some uh, she doesn't have. Let's talk about where I should focus my development. Okay, and then our next question, um, we're nearing the end. I think we've just got, actually, we've got two more. What is the next step if feedback is not working with one specific person? For instance, fighting back the facts or the assessment or providing a reason for everything that person did. Is there any specific tactic beyond the typical approach for preliminary exposure, um, exposition of facts, company objectives, ideal behavior, and where we are falling short? There are so many reasons why the feedback uh, may not have the impact intended. Very often we see situations when the personal why hasn't been articulated well. And uh, Angela was saying that when uh, somebody, when, when you've articulated the why uh, to, to the person, when you've created this uh, moment of meaning for them, why it is important for them to hear, internalize, and act of feedback, most people will actually do that. Now, let's imagine that you have done that. And you've sat down and the person understands why, but then still disagrees with feedback. Uh, then you need to question whether you are credible in giving that feedback. That is, do you, uh, does the person respect your experience, your qualifications, your uh, job as a manager and as, as a leader? Uh, do you have enough data points? Do you have specific examples? Have you brought all that in, uh, to the table with a positive intent, uh, with the intent to help the person improve. And uh, uh, maybe there is a conversation around um, uh, precisely that and uh, convincing your employee that you have her best interest uh, at heart. Uh, very often people don't want to hear feedback because they think that your job is to put them on a performance improvement plan uh, while that may not be your intent at all. So, Having an honest conversation around that uh, might uh, uh, might help, and uh, also um, th th there is a category of employees that are unable to hear feedback. Uh, as uh, sad as it, it is, there is enough of um, psychological research that there are people who are pretty much uncoachable. Uh, those cases are uh, not as uh, common as people who really want to change and to want. Uh, uh, to do good, but uh, it might be the case that uh, it, it can be incredibly hard uh, to make people uh, hear that feedback. And, and Sergey, I would I would build on uh, on those great thoughts, but just have a think about accountability. One of the things that um, 
is often the case is that there are no um, there are no implications for somebody not acting on feedback. And if we accept that as creatures, we're kind of more likely to do what is most comfortable, we're more likely to do what works for us now without thinking, you know, longer term. Um, in the absence of uh, accountability, we actually sometimes enable people to, you know, give in to some of our kind of more expedient um, uh, behaviors. And, you know, when you think about accountability, you know, uh, Mark Efron, a great colleague of ours, you know, kind of described the continuum where, you know, somebody has absolutely no implication uh, for doing what we might think of as kind of quote unquote the wrong thing um, to, you know, very serious implications at the other end. And Mark's writings encourage us just to ask ourselves as leaders, are we really holding people accountable? Um, and you know, um, just challenging ourselves whether or not we're uh, enabling uh, poor, poor, you know, behaviours. So I would just add that. Um, okay. So, when giving feedback to a subordinate, is it preferable that a leader always gives the "what in it for them" reasons or benefits, or use the "just do it" approach? as some subordinates are more prone to just following directions, while others can be better motivated when highlighting the benefits. You know, yesterday I was in a yoga class and uh, my in, in instructor, as, as I was trying all different poses and I'm a terrible uh, yogi, uh, so <laughs> the, the, the instructor was constantly saying, I, I, I like it better, uh, well done, uh, very well. And he was correcting me all the time, you know, just with his hands and uh, lifting my leg and arm. So he was giving me uh, physically uh, constructive feedback all the time. But with his words, uh, he was encouraging all the time. So uh, I would say it's situation dependent. In that situation, I didn't need the powerful why. I need to get into the correct pose. So I was willingly following uh, what the instructor was doing with me. And in many situations, just correcting, you, you know, saying, yes, you're on course, you're off course, well done, uh, you're doing so, so, such a great, just change that thing is a good approach. In, in other situations, uh, that personal meaning of why the person needs to change and improve uh, will, be, uh, will be much better. And I would argue that in today's world of lack of attention, and uh, we live in the economy of meaning. Uh, the, uh, the, the provider, the leader, the, the, the person who is able to create a greater sense of meaning in us, we will follow them. So I would argue that in our world of this uh, uh, meaning deficit, uh, creating the powerful why will be beneficial in, 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 all, in all cases, uh, irrespective of the situation. Okay, thank you very much for that answer. How does one give honest feedback and at the same time be sensitive towards a person whom you are giving feedback to? This is a two part question, so I'll let you answer that bit first and then there's another part. Angela, I mean, you're I, an expert I, in interpersonal sensitivity. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, here is what I would um, suggest. I think that. I mean, having a knowledge of the person you're talking to is helpful. Uh, it's not always possible. Sometimes we're giving feedback to people we don't know so well. Maybe it's remote. There's a lot of complexity in our work environment. But for the main part, you know, we perhaps know people and we can temper what we're saying with that knowledge. Where my head is at, though, is so long as it's not, you know, brutal. I'll use uh, Sergey's example of Winston Churchill. Don't do a Winston Churchill on someone. But you can also be, I think, appropriately matter of fact, because you, we're going to encourage you to talk about the behavior that you uh, saw or the behavior that you need to see, not the person themselves. So, you know, prepare your feedback around, I want to talk about, you know, uh, strategic planning, or let's talk about, um, 
uh, this negotiation that's coming up or whatever it happens to be, um, I would encourage us to try and make sure that we're talking about the uh, the issue, not the person, and therefore can be more matter of fact rather than needing to be sensitive. There is an exception to that. What if the feedback is is truly personal? You know, you are, you know, I don't know, making other people feel uncomfortable with some behaviour, something like that. Then you might need to actually get your sensitivity antenna up. But I would encourage us to be more matter of fact because people are more likely to not hear it than hear it. Uh, we're sensitive creatures. If we try and be sensitive, if we try and overlay concern about relationships and things, we may just convolute it so much that we actually don't give people the very thing that they need, which is our truth. Uh, so um, appropriately, matter of fact, not brutal, but just this is what you know, say what you see. Okay, thank you very much for that. And the remaining of that question was, secondly, how do you deal with a manager that dominates discussions that are meant to provide you with the necessary feedback to assist in improving work relationships? Well, that manager uh, is in dire need of feedback. <laughs> Somebody... <laughs> <laughs> Somebody needs, uh, and, and it's very likely that the manager is not aware of that. So actually, uh, feedback uh, in, in, in true feedback cultures flows in all directions, uh, downwards, sideways, upwards, and uh, giving feedback um, can help you build a great relation, a better relationship with your manager because uh, it demonstrates that first, you care enough, and second, you have the courage to uh, bring that to your manager's attention. Okay, perfect. And then our last question, what makes feedback go bad? Oh, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there, there are so, 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 several reasons. Uh, Angela already talked about uh, the three Bs. Uh, and, and that's when you really uh, fail to, to craft the message correctly. It can be battling. I don't know what to do with it, or you're giving me feedback on things I can't change. It can be bogus, uh, so your intentions are questionable. You might be too political about it, or it can be brutal when you uh, are really devastating the person, even though it can be true. So uh, get your message right, that's first. Um, second, why it might go bad, and we already talked about it, is emotions. So dealing with emotions, uh, not only with emotions of the receiver, but with your own emotions, right? You might have performance anxiety, or you might be naturally uh, interpersonally sensitive to others. So it might be hard for you to give um, particularly constructive feedback to other people. And um, the third uh, type of, um, you know, what might go wrong is uh, not taking context into consideration. Uh, feedback takes place across cultures. We live in an increasing, increasingly more intercultural world. Uh, we can give feedback to people in different means, um, in, um, across genders. Uh, there is a lot of research saying that men and women receive, uh, receive feedback differently, and you need to account for that. Uh, giving feedback to subordinates versus to bosses. So all of those cross uh, boundaries, you know, uh, the, the contextual access of feedback would be the third uh, big buckets of things of why feedback might go wrong. And so, if I could build on it, I would say the single biggest reason the feedback goes bad is because it doesn't get given. So there are, <laughs> as 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 Sergei described, like a number of reasons where you know things can uh, can get off the track. And they're not an argument for not giving feedback, they're an argument for trying to get a bit of a toolbox that would help you do it well. And doing it well is not hard. Um, you do need to do a bit of thinking, but it really is a doable skill to look, that, you can, uh, that you can learn. But so again, I did some original research where we talked to 
uh, a population of, of, of HR pr professionals across the globe, business leaders across the globe. And, you know, we ask things like, you know, do you, do you give feedback? How frequently? And you would be surprised at how many people are just not doing it. And I think the biggest harm that we could do uh, to a subordinate, to anyone we cared about, in fact, um, would be to, to deprive them of the thing they needed to improve. And a little bit of effort, it's not a lot, a little bit of effort just to prepare and structure your feedback pays huge dividends. So, yeah, the worst thing that can happen is it doesn't get done. Well, Sergey and Angela, that is the end of our questions. I don't think I've ever have had a webinar run 25 minutes over the scheduled time. So, I mean, that's just testament to how good this webinar has been, how engaging you have both been as speakers and how great the topic has been because more than half the audience has also stayed on to further listen to the webinar and kept asking questions even once we had finished. So, you know, it, that's amazing. So thank you very much for taking out your time um, and giving it to deliver this webinar. Thank you. Um, thank you all thank for you so listening. Much, no, no problem at all. Thank you all for listening. I hope everyone has a great holiday season and hopefully you can join us in the new year for our webinar on the 21st of January, again at the same time midday, on redefining leadership, moving business performance from KPIs to a mind-blowing creative approach. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Angela, and thank you, Sergey. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their days. Thank you. Thank you, take care. Thank you, bye.